Uh, you probably have some questions to Finn. Elina? So what are the three countries where the IA doesn't work? <laughs> I tell you which the three countries are. One is the Comoros. That's really important, right? That's just a very special case. I mean, an extremely small country. But then there are two countries which are important. Ghana and Tanzania. And we have studied those two. And we are right, almost, we are just at the brink of coming up with why is it that you cannot, with the standard time series model, find it. That is because, in the Tanzanian case, because President Nyerere did not understand macroeconomics. Unfortunately, he was only concerned about nation building, which was a good thing, but he did not understand that when his exchange rate kept going up and up and up and became overvalued, that completely screwed his economy. That's not in itself news. I mean, Ben Wendulu, who gave the presentation this morning, I mean, he was in the 1980s, he was the key advisor or a, a, a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam who was making exactly this point. But it's the first time that we've been able to show that when you account for that fact in a time series analysis, then you have the explanation. And from around 1987, Tanzania is like the rest. So in other words, the reason why you don't find it yet in the data is that first period. And that had nothing to do with whether aid works or not. That had something to do with good old <coughs> President Nyerere, who had a different agenda. And that really was not because of aid. If you wanted to blame aid, anything in that context, it was maybe that it kept him going a little bit longer than he otherwise would have been able to. And then you're saying, oh, but does that mean that aid, to some extent, that's because we gave him the benefit of the doubt. We actually supported his nation building project, right? The other country, Ghana, that is simply because the 1980s in Ghana are really characterized by pretty big swings. In, well, you have all seen the pictures of leaders getting executed on the beach and so on. So, I mean, this was just such an incredibly uh, swinging period that that simply does not, I mean, it doesn't give you anything when you put it into the data. It's just, you can't get it, quite frankly. Again, from around 1987 onwards, Ghana is the standard story. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know who, do I just, uh, uh, please, okay. Then maybe you can say something about the definition of aid and yeah, the perceived sure. self-interest of the donated countries. Sure, sure. Um, first of all, when we use aid in these types of analysis, we typically use DAX figures. And that's essentially because that's the only place where you, over many years, have collected systematically uh, information on aid that goes from the DAC and also some other countries to developing countries. And it's the only sort of systematic database that's available. Um, that database has a number of deficiencies when you get down to details. One of the reasons why you will not find very many studies of the impact of disaggregated aid, so the impact of budget support, the impact of uh, different types of aid, is because then the database becomes quite weak. But we do have numbers on the total sum. So that's why some of us tend just to focus on the total, because that's a number that we have over the years. There is another uh, database under construction by something called Aid Data, but they are looking purely at microdata. So they're purely looking at individual projects. And one of the reasons why DAC, uh, the DAC database is, is, is important and interesting is because it gives this macro story, or this gives it this macro. Because again, you can do as many studies as you want at micro, and I used to do that in the 1980s and 1990s, and every time I came up with a new story, I was just told, oh, but it doesn't work in aggregate anyway, so you, you're, just using, you're just wasting your time. Now, in terms of the interest of the donors, there are plenty of studies to show a few things. First of all, that relatively more aid does go to relatively more poor countries. So to say that, a, that, that, that the level of poverty has no impact on aid giving is wrong. More aid does go to poorer countries, relatively speaking. And that's actually one of the, sorry, if I can just make a parenthesis. This is exactly one of the reasons why this attribution problem is so complicated. Because 
when poor countries get richer, then what happens to the aid? Then the aid goes down. So when you just look at the plot, then it looks as if the richer the country is, the less aid you have. Ah, so the less aid you have, the better you are. But that's actually analytically complicated to separate out. Parenthesis finished. Um, when it comes then to other arguments for why donors give aid, oh, there's absolutely no question that these motives, they're not pure. There are in established academic literature, it's shown that there is the so-called Egypt and Israel factor. We, we, we analytically tend to, 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 to try to handle it by what we call a dummy. In other words, you simply put in a, a, an effect to, to try to capture the impact that these two countries are so special. Why? Well, they've gotten so much bloody aid from the US over so many years, right? Now, that's where the Afghanistan and so on f factor kicks in now. It's also well, well established that you give more aid to your former colonies. It's also well established that you give more aid to countries where you have more commercial interest. So all of that is absolutely, you know, that, that, that's not in doubt. That it's not like pure and simple. But at the same time, while I call myself a development economist, and I'm probably more development than economist, mm -hmm. I tend to think of resources, of savings and investment and so on, like things that are important. I mean, I'm not saying it's important in any simple way, but I do know from what I have studied over the years that in order to grow and develop, you need savings and you need investments, and these savings can come either from domestically or from internationally. And it's bloody hard to save in a very poor country. So, well, so that's sort of... But one should not have illusions. And there are also aid administrations that are influencing the aid, and that, those, those motives are not always nice and clear and simple. But at the end of the day, I mean, if I were to be sort of a bit brutal, if money actually arrives in Mozambique, and over 25 years actually keeps that country hanging together, helps build infrastructure, helps put kids in school, helps vaccinate kids, help build dwells, help get the government administration to function minimally. Do I really care exactly what drives that? Well, if you talk about the, the effect in the media, if, if you would call it investment money for, uh, in my case, Dutch companies, it sounds yeah. very different than when you call it aid. We have a totally different discussion about the same thing. Yeah, sure. No, I, I, but but I, th that may be one of the ways to phrase it. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, can we come up with a different... I mean, I tend not to speak about aid. I tend to speak about development cooperation. But, but I mean, I've, I've sort of been forced into this boxing kind of... <laughs> yeah? Uh, uh, you raised up an interesting question because how we should do all this. Because over the, the decades, as far as I remember, there have been different styles of uh, doing the development cooperation or helping the poorest countries and... Uh, in Finland, we made the water process uh, for, for a while. Now we are supporting uh, different process or countries. And how do you see these kind of trends and uh, having an effect? And what, what seems to be working? Well, all evidence that I have access to is suggesting that, in general, it's very hard to separate out a very strong difference between budget support and project aid. Because essentially, it's like, it's like, it's like when you're in, in, in your garden. And then there you have a shovel and you have a spade. Okay, you use the spade for certain purposes and you use your shovel for other purposes. I mean, these different tools, they're used for different purposes. And they have different sort of effects, yes. But when you're sort of talking about the overall picture, when do you give budget support? Well, you give budget support when you are in countries where you want that country to build up its own auditing institutions, because then you need to sort of get into, you can call it a training process if you wish, that you have to give a block of money for, for, for that institution to learn how to do that, to manage that, to audit it, to follow it. But you can also have project aid in complicated, in Guinea-Bissau, I mean, of course, nobody would ever even dream 
of giving uh, budget support to Guinea-Bissau because the, in Guinea-Bissau the central administration doesn't work. So in Guinea-Bissau what do you do? Well then you try to go in with specific project activities, with specific so-called interventions where you either build a road or you try to disarm some, you know, I mean, where you, at least you can sort of keep that type of control. So, I, in my view, I mean, I have never really seen any sort of really convincing evidence where you can distinguish clearly between these different types of flows. Yeah, please. Yeah, so you mentioned Mozambique and um, that if the aid keeps it hanging in there for 20 years, that's a good thing. But what do you say to criticisms that come from the uh, developing countries? Uh, you frequently hear them saying that aid keeps them sort of... Uh, um, how to say, uh, sort of addicted to aid, so they don't do anything themselves to change. So, for example, if they get aid for science, they don't bother to invest their own money into research. So, what do you say? I mean, do you have any evidence yeah, yeah. on that? How many cigarettes do you have to smoke a day to become addicted? How many cigarettes? I mean, no, but, no, but to, to become really addicted and have a problem, or for that matter, how many, um, how many rum and cokes do you need per day to become addicted? I mean, two, five, ten? Try to think about the, what I said before about the size of the aid. Do you really genuinely believe that on average, three and a half dollars per person per year? And in when it really goes high, $25, do you really think that that is sort of leading to that addiction? I, I have to say that I just can't, I mean, I just can't make the calculus square. I mean, I certainly understand, and I illustrated that with the Tanzania example, that there have been specific examples where this happened, absolutely. But in general, in general, aid pulls out when these things happen. Aid was pulled out in the 1980s because countries we're not quite sort of doing what they were supposed to do. So that sort of addiction thing, I mean, for me to get really addicted, I need a bottle of rum every day for a while, and the, the, the money is just not big enough to buy that bottle of rum a day for a long time. Yes, uh, I hope you don't mind if I disagree no, no, with no, you absolutely. on what you just said. Uh, when you say the media doesn't cover uh, aid the way it should. It's because in the media we know from experience that what people want to hear is not a long list of statistics but a story with a human content. They want to know about their fellow human beings. So in fact my perception of aid has always been that it's tax money from ordinary people mostly in the West but also Japan and a few other such places and it's supposed to have a positive impact, again, on ordinary people, but mm -hmm. in places like Africa, where people are so much poor. Yeah. Uh, I've never heard a convincing case that it's supposed to have a macroeconomic effect, positive or negative. It's a response to a perception of need, and I wish to address that need. So, uh, to that extent, uh, Addiction is actually much easier than you'd imagine because that $25 per person per year is not spread through the millions of people. It's usually focused on specific projects. And if people see a project spring up from nowhere, like say in northeastern Kenya, which is very dry, uh, NORAD or SIDA or whoever come in and put a series of watering points for the camel herders or the goat herders or the uh, cattle, uh, cattle herders. If those wells dry because they're not being properly looked after, because these are nomadic people, they move all over the place, they don't stay in one place. Of course, they don't say, what can we do for ourselves? They say, okay, so that was an allegiance. When are the French coming to dig a few wells here? Because the psychology is one of help comes from the outside. So I'm not saying I'm sympathetic to those who uh, criticize aid and say it shouldn't be there, but the fact is that if I receive help for no apparent reason from people who are not asking me to give them anything back, I begin to have a view of the world which is full of good people who if you only ask them nicely they'll give you things. 
And, and that's no different from a, a woman I saw as I was walking from the earlier conference to this one, sitting on the side of the road with a cup in her hand. If she sits there for four days and no one gives her money, she'll go away. If every day two or three kind people give her money, she will continue sitting there. So it, it's a matter of psychology, not statistics. I, I, there, there are lots of things in what you're saying. Uh, let me try and see sort of whether I can, I can sort of give a, a, a comment. I mean, the first thing is that I do believe that the macro story is important because it certainly is not brought up when Dambi Samori is standing here and speaking. People then take it in. When the economist is using the story, it's a down the rat hole. I mean, so I, there, must be, there must be something out there which is also happening at that macro level. I do understand the issue about that you need the human stories, but they are there. If you look behind the statistics, I mean, just take, for example, these various reports that are now being prepared because of the post-2015 development agenda. If you actually dig behind those numbers, they're human beings. And you are seeing, actually, the poverty numbers have decreased very substantially compared to what it otherwise would have looked. And those are human beings. If you're looking at the educational standards, I, I mean, are you actually, have, I mean, have you actually checked how many boys and girls are actually now actually going to school? And that actually girls are almost at the same rate as, as boys in Africa? I'm not then trying to say everything is good. It's not. There is a lot still to be achieved. But compared to 15 years ago, it is. And there are human, I mean, there are stories there to be told. Now, when you then are talking about when aid sometimes, and aid does sometimes do that, if they go in and they haven't done proper preparatory work. But a lot of aid is not just something that drops down from heaven. It is actually very often con uh, uh, associated with a whole range of preparatory processes and, you would say, conditionalities. And there's nothing in what I have said which has any implications for what I consider the best way of that relationship. I've actually put in writing that I personally find that aid should be considered a contractual relationship in general. Now, then you have a problem. What do you then do when you're having a country where it's very difficult to have a contractual relationship because there's no government? What do you do? I mean, th then it's a little bit sort of difficult to, to... I believe that they can still do something sensible. Does that mean that there wasn't a Norwegian project up where in some that sort of got somebody to think, well, I, have, I think that Africa has a general problem, that there is unfortunately still a tendency for people to expect that they are entitled to get a share and if one of your family members is doing very well, like Ben Ndulu, who's now central bank governor in, in Tanzania, then he says, well, my cousins, they're still expecting that they can get their share of my salary. But that's not the fault of aid, excuse me. I mean, that's, an, that, that's another set of mechanisms. Uh, that's another set of history. That's another set of entitlement expectations that are built up over long historical processes. I mean, I, mean, I, do, I hope you, you see that I am trying to respond but that it can be sometimes a bit difficult to say yes or no. Can I just um, yeah, sure. add on to the point that my colleague there sure. made? Um, it's all fine that aid works on, on several levels, and that's not a question here, I think. Um, but because you had posed the question in the beginning and you were provocative in your approach, um, I wish to address that particular thing that you said on how journalists don't report on the positive side. But I think the fact that economists use um, language that's very detached from the audiences that we write for mm -hmm. and use um, so much data and use academic writing to support their points, it's really hard for journalists to actually sit down, filter through all that information and come up with a good story. Now, we're not saying that the stories don't exist. There's good stories about aid, and there's really good stories to be told locally about the impacts of aid on, on the economy and on different areas of the country. But the fact remains, economists are really hard to interview. Economists are hard to access, especially locally. Like, I'm from the Pacific, 
And in my country, there's only three qualified economists. So when I want to write about aid, if I don't get the data online, um, I have to find an economist to try and um, translate this data to terms that my readers would understand. But even talking to an economist, it's really hard because they still speak in a language that is very different and detached to, to those that my audience would understand. So there's several layers there. That's the reason why we don't necessarily write positive stories about aid, apart from the fact that it's, in, it's better to write a, a story that is uh, more towards the angle that will actually make a difference. Um, writing negative stories per se on aid actually improves aid in a country. For instance, in Samoa, if aid, is, if aid funding is mismanaged, and I've written about it, it means that future aid that comes into the country is better managed and more transparent. So therefore, there's a lot to be said for stories that do cover the other aspects of aid. But in defense of journalists, um, <laughs> I just want to say that it's data. It's a data issue. You, I'm sure there's data out there. I'm positive there is, I've seen it, but I don't have the time to sit down for hours, read through your academic papers, go through your numbers, and then localize the story. So, you want so the if you can to present it to me better. So you want the economist to do your work? No, no you see, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, clearly, there is a communication issue, and that I recognize. It's absolutely clear, and I completely... Uh, one of the reasons that we are trying to do this work, one of the reasons that I'm here rather than writing another academic paper is because I like to communicate about it. And I am trying to speak relatively directly and communicate the best I can. And I have not even put one single formula up there today. I've not even put one. Congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, of course, because I share this and I do understand. I mean, uh, we are, we are, well, I'm one of the people who are flunking students to, for their exams when they don't speak in clear, clear language, right? So I understand what you're saying, but I obviously was referring more to information-rich contexts. And I can assure you that in the North, in the developed countries, the lot, there is a lot of information available which the journalist could pick up, which is not being picked up. And that was the one I was referring more specifically to. I think it's fair to say that there are, of course, also information poorer, more constrained situation, absolutely. But it is for me, a little bit of a paradox why, for example, a Bjorn Lombok who says that the world has absolutely no problem with environmental change can go on being cited in all of the nice places, whereas all the academic evidence is piling up. I, I, I just, I mean, that's another illustration of the same thing. And, and it's a little bit that which I'm reacting towards. I do recognize that lots of economists, they speak with wool in their mouth and they're very hard to understand. I don't understand them many times. But then I insist that I need to understand. Then maybe you could push them, kick them. Say that they won't get in the news if they don't get, become clear. Mm -hmm.